So what we will do this class is we will look at some uh, characteristics of the LNA we want to design. Right? We will start off with the design of the LNA, we will see what we want to do at the input, what we want to do at the, uh, so first of all we need to do an input matching right? because the signal coming in from the antenna is going to be a 50 ohm uh, port. So we need to match the input to 50 ohms. So we look at different uh, ways to match the input. Then we look at what kind of uh, load we are going to have for the LNA. Uh, next class we will try to look at the overall LNA, you know some additional stuff we need to do, what design procedure we need to follow and so on. So actually there is not a lot more to it, right? Most of these LNAs are, uh, most of the common LNAs will be single transistor or two transistor structures. There is nothing, you know, super, <coughs> nothing very fancy about it from the topology point of view. Okay, so we have studied the noise of the two port, noise of the MOSFET. We are going to study the input match, output match and you know the gain uh, next class and then we will be done. Okay, okay. so let us get on uh, with the uh, input matching. Okay, so what kind of input matches can you think of? So you have a you have a source coming in, signal source coming in with 50 ohms. Okay, obviously the input uh, of a MOSFET is capacitive, right? So you need to find some way to transform it to a resistive. You, you either add a resistive component, okay, or create a resistive component using the circuit structure. So we'll look at both ways. Okay, so the first structure we'll look at. is the resistor match. This is your RS. So let us say we are looking at a common source topology. <coughs> it has some load uh, RL, okay? but you do not have to consider the load, you can just look at the output current for example, that is okay. And obviously the easiest way to do it is to to use one, use a resistor Rn. For low frequencies, very obviously the MOSFET is open circuit, very high impedance. So the impedance is going to be uh, just R1, right? So it's going to be well matched and it's a fairly broadband match. It's not a narrow band match, okay? So this is a fairly broadband match, okay? And what you're going to do, you're going to make R1 equal Rs for power matching, okay? So let us call the signal here Vn. What is Vn here? It is just Vs over 2, right? So actually what you are doing is, it is Vn is Vs over 2. So what you are doing is before adding your amplifier, you are already attenuating your signal by half. So that is, we will see that that is an obvious problem with this structure, okay? And you have thermal noise from R1, okay? Which is adding directly at the input, okay? Adding noise at the output is okay, right? Because it gets, if you remember the overall noise figure gets attenuated by the gain and that is the reason why we are adding the LNA. In this case, we are adding R1 noise right at the input, okay? So if you, so you can calculate your overall noise figure for this circuit. I'll just give you the expression. It's two plus four gamma over alpha times one over GMRS. Okay. You'll probably have a homework problem, I think, at some point of time, maybe in a week, or in a couple of weeks, to calculate this out by hand. Okay. Either this or something similar. But this is the, this is the noise figure. So obviously, what does this mean? So that means that your uh, that's your noise factor. So your noise figure is definitely greater than 3 dB because you already have a 2 there. 2 stands for a noise figure of 3 dB, right? So that means you cannot even imagine to have noise figures of you know 0.5, 1 dB or something like that, which is required in many cases. Okay. So definitely, noise figure is greater than. 3 dB 
and that's a fundamental problem we saw why right first of all you're cutting the signal by half and you're adding noise from r1 so obviously there's a problem okay so let's see what else can be done okay you can try to use some kind of feedback okay actually let's add a resistor here r1 forget about biasing for now we just look at the signal quantities so we add some kind of feedback resistor rf okay so using that you can match your input to 50 ohms and this has the added advantage of course you don't have any attenuation before the amplifier so directly going into the amplifier you you have uh, vs right okay but you still have noise from this guy okay and you can analyze this circuit also and you can show that your the noise figure of this circuit is still greater than the f min you can actually achieve with a normal common source okay okay why do you need r you don't have to have r1 actually it just gives you an extra degree of freedom that's all you don't have to have r1 there okay oh man not a good way to start the class okay the uh, the third kind we look at is the uh, common yes so in this case also you could that the the yes so you actually trade off so okay so the thing is your input is attenuated at any time you add a physical resistor your input is going to be v is going to be vs by 2 that's okay that's because of matching okay but if it is part of the amplifier that's okay but if it's part of a physical circuit which are adding before it then there's a problem that is all okay we'll see how the actual signal going into the amplifier doesn't have to be uh, you know less than the input signal we'll come to it later in later in later in today's class okay okay the third way of doing it is a common gate i'm sure you've all seen the common gate structure you all you all remember the common gate structure right i think it's uh, pretty it's very basic stuff <coughs> okay so so this is actually a bias but we'll ignore biasing for now okay what is the input impedance it's a function of the gm of this transistor and your load impedance rl okay and you can design it to be equal to 1 over rs okay sorry yeah so gm is 1 over rs obviously so rn is rs okay and this is also a fairly broadband match okay and of course since you don't have a physical resistor it's actually slightly better than the other one you can actually get better f mins than the previous previous case okay so what we'll do is we'll analyze the common gate amplifier find out the noise figure so to simplify our uh, you know our calculations we'll ignore gate noise for now okay gate noise is something that gets added at higher frequencies and it also you know adds on top of the drain noise but we'll calculate what is the long channel case i guess you could you could call it the long channel case okay sir because typically the signal coming in is usually a voltage source okay so if you have an antenna coming you know connected to a circuit it's usually a voltage coming in but you could have other cases like uh, not necessarily wireless but you may have wireline cases where there may be a photodiode and then there's a uh, signal current okay but in most cases you would be getting a signal voltage okay and uh, actually what we'll see is when we go into uh, study mixers next what you'll see is yeah it's actually easier in many cases if you have a signal you know a current signal going in but since the many, most of the circuits we have produce voltages we'll need to have good transconductors and so on okay we'll study that as part of mixers also 
you'll see the same problem there. So we'll just draw the equivalent circuit of the common gate. Okay, so we'll look at uh, I out squared, actually I n out squared, and um, this is the drain noise. Okay, so what you want to do is to calculate the noise figure, you need to calculate I n out squared, and we'll start from again the basic definition, right? Find out the noise due to RS alone, and then noise due to RS plus your circuit. Okay. And uh, this is VNRS in our case. So let's see. So let's just use the uh, linear quantities first, then we'll move on to the powers. This is your drain noise. <coughs> okay. So what we'll do is, first of all, assume VNRS and IND are uncorrelated okay and i think that's a fair assumption okay so what we'll do is we'll calculate the output noise due to vnrs first then output noise due to ind and then since they are uncorrelated we can square and add the powers the mean square powers okay what is in out is nothing but minus gmvs okay let's do it this way statistical quantities okay so vs is is vn rs plus what is the current flowing through rs it's the same as i n out Okay, so these are the two equations, and then you get this, right? Now you can get I N out in terms of V uh, N R S. Okay, the sign really doesn't mean anything, right? Because we are dealing with noise quantities, you are uh, going to end up squaring them and adding the mean square powers. Okay. Now let's consider IND. Okay. So what is VS? So now you don't no longer have VNR squared. So it's nothing but. This remains the same. So instead of uh, Vs plus I N out Rs, you only have I N out Rs. Right? This is now a short. You are no longer considering this source. Okay? And you only have this. But of course, you need to consider Gm Vgs also. So we will write the second equation. I N out is. minus gmvs plus ind okay
Is that clear? IND over 1 plus TMRS. <coughs> now, what else do you know? You also know two more, one more thing. When you want to match, you are going to make sure GM is 1 over RS. Right? So, what is this guy? <clears throat> right? Minus GM over 2. And then I am also going to rewrite this as we know GM is, so I am going to rewrite this like this. And similarly, Similarly, I can rewrite this as <coughs> IND over 2. Okay? So, what is your total noise? So, it's just this squared, I and out squared is this squared plus this squared. Yes? Sorry, by 4, by 4 R squared. Right? <coughs> okay. So, what is your total all, uh, overall noise figure? Is I know total squared? Okay. This is nothing but 1 plus Is that clear? Okay, 1 plus R square times what is I and D squared? 4 kT gamma GD naught delta F. V and R squared is 4 kT R S delta F. Okay, so this is 1 plus gamma GD naught R S. Okay. Okay. But what do you know? You also know RS is one over GM. Okay. So at the end, you'll see why we are doing this. What is GM over GD naught? It's alpha. Okay. We represent it by alpha, right? So this is one plus gamma over alpha. So effectively. We have considered only drain noise, but it pretty much depends only on device parameters. Okay, gamma and alpha, nothing else. Okay, and for a long channel, what is F? Gamma is two thirds, alpha is one, so it's 1.67. <coughs> is approximately 2.2 dB. Okay. Okay. For a short channel, what will happen is gamma increases, alpha decreases. Okay. So both those things will end up increasing your noise figure for a short channel MOSFET. But this is, in some sense, in in some sense, it's the minimum noise figure you can achieve with a um, with a common gate. Okay. Okay. But we want to achieve even lower noise figures. Okay, we are not satisfied with just 2.2 dB. We want to go lower. Okay, so now let's consider. The input impedance of a MOSFET with a with some Z, ZS degeneration. 
okay okay so what does this do give me a minute Okay. Interesting. Okay. 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 So let's do the uh, equivalent circuit and find out the input impedance in terms of Zs, and then we will find out what happens when you put in different components for Zs. Okay. So we'll try to use the simplest model we can. We have CGS and GM. Let's assume we have some RL here. Okay. Have the source. So what we're going to do is. So since we want to find the input impedance. We will apply a VG, voltage VG, find out what current flows through, the ratio of those is the input impedance. Okay. So first of all, so what is the source voltage? It is nothing but VG minus VGS over ZS, that is the current flowing through here. Okay. Equals GM VGS, sorry, GM VGS plus IG. Okay, that is one equation we will write. So, in other words, IG times ZS plus VGS times. Okay, so this is one equation we have. <coughs> okay, so the second equation we are going to write is just here because <coughs> we know the relation between VGS and IG because it is just through a capacitance CGS. Okay. Okay, so what does this mean? So we'll just replace VGS here. So VG is IGZS plus one plus GM ZS IG over SCGS. So what is that in that is nothing but VG over IG. So you have ZS plus you get a 1 over SCGS. Okay. Okay. Is everybody able to see this? Not going too low, right? Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. 
Hmm? Remove the circles. Doesn't seem to be helping. No. Are you, you guys are able to read it, right? So it's good enough. We'll just go on. I don't know what the problem is. Okay. Okay. Um, give me a minute. Let me get these the, the toolbars. Okay. Okay. So, this is the form, right? For some arbitrary ZS. So, let's just put in different values. We'll put resistor, capacitor, inductor. Those are three kinds of passive circuits. We'll see what happens in each case. Okay. I'm going to put in ZS equals RS. What is ZN? RS plus. Okay, so it's RS plus 1 over SCGS plus GMRS over SCGS. So what is this? If you have to draw the equivalent circuit, so you have RS, which is this. You have some C equivalent, which is okay, G CGS over 1 plus GMRS. This is approximately, so let us assume GMRS is greater than 1. Okay. So, what is this? This is approximately one over omega t times R S. Okay. Okay. But that is not what we want, anyways. Okay. Okay, so what happens when you put ZS equals a capacitor CS? One over SCS <coughs> plus right. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward, which is so z in of let's look at z in of j omega, okay, because we have an s squared term. So CS plus CGS over. Okay, this is the first two terms. You have a now because you have a s squared, you get a negative term. Okay, so you get a minus GM over omega squared CS CGS term. So if you had to draw an equivalent circuit, it looks something like this. So this is CS CGS over. Okay. And this is obviously a big problem. Okay, because in most cases you don't want any negative resistances in your circuit. You obviously you might remember that it leads to instability, oscillations, all those kind of problems. Okay, so you definitely don't want to consider putting a capacitor at the source. Okay, and obviously you don't want your LNA to oscillate, right? So, okay, what is the third case? We'll put an inductor. <coughs> so 
so it's just ZS plus okay it's SLS plus 1 over SCGS plus GMLS over CGS so if you had to draw an equivalent circuit <coughs> capacitance is the same inductance is the same but the nice thing is you get a positive resistive term okay and this is this is nothing but omega t times ls okay and this is what you want why because without adding a real resistor you are actually getting a resistive component which means you can match to 50 ohms without adding any noise those are the two things you wanted to do okay so what you are going to do is so for power match you are going to set omega t ls is 50 ohms ok now you should also note ok so let us look at let us calculate the other things ok so now you have managed to match to 50 ohms what else do you need you also want to get rid of ls and cgs okay where do they resonate at okay 1 over 2 pi ls cgs <clears throat> okay so what that means is so let's say you have designed your transistor so this obviously this omega t is omega t of the transistor let's say you have designed it for gain and noise and so on okay so that's you can't you know you can't fix that but now you can choose ls such that your input is power matched to 50 ohms now the problem is once you design your transistor your cgs omega t are known so what that means is f naught is you can't decide f naught okay so you you power matched it but the resonant frequency may be way off okay so what you need is a, another degree of freedom okay so what we are going to do is add an, another degree of freedom by adding an inductor at the gate of the transistor okay so what we want to do is we want to add another inductor in series with this resonant circuit call that LG ok so now what is that in it's the same as before except you now have <coughs> you have omega t ls which is the real portion ok j omega t times lg plus ls plus 1 over ok so the nice thing about this so to set power match you set ls and to set your frequency of uh, uh, oscillate i mean the, free, uh, the resonant frequency you set LG because it depends on LG plus LS but of course obviously you what you have done is you have actually brought the resonant frequency lower obviously you cannot go higher higher than LS right LS plus LS times CGS if you add a capacitance in series with LS Yes. Yes. You can, but biasing becomes a little bit more difficult. There might be ways around that too. Sure, you might be able to do that. Okay. But the thing is, you in general you want to avoid negative resistances because you want to even in this case, for example, right? What do you you still have CSB here, right? The source to bulk capacitance. You definitely still want to be very careful. You don't want to add any capacitance at the source node. Okay.
okay okay now let's look at one more thing what is the q of a series resonant network omega l by r okay <coughs> so in this case okay so remember so you still have rs vs okay that is the q of the resonant uh, uh, resonant network right you have rs you have omega tls that's your real portion is that clear to everyone okay now so let's say you have a voltage v do you remember what the voltage across the inductor and the capacitor is it's q times v right so let me just put the smart t magnitude of the voltage is q times v okay so what that means is if you see in this case the voltage the gate to source voltage of the transistor okay is actually q in times vs so remember when we talked about the series uh, resonant network i told you it can be used for passive amplification so this is one case okay the other advantage of doing this kind of matching is that you actually get some extra amplification through your q okay and if you want to write it in terms of v in which is the voltage here sometimes because you are interested in the voltage at the input of the amplifier itself rather than vs so okay okay so what is your effective gm okay the effective gm of the overall combination is 2q in v in sorry sorry 2q in times gm okay so because instead of relating to vs we are relating it to v in okay so remember r vs and rs are characteristics of the source which is driving the amplifier you may want to do it in terms of the voltage seen at the input of the amplifier itself okay Is that clear to everyone okay so you also get some effective extra amplification from the q okay so what do you do about the output so looks like we are all set for the input <coughs> so let's replace this by this gm effective so let's say this is the gate <coughs> times v in okay what do you do at the output so at the output you can add another resonant circuit okay okay to get some because what you know is you want a narrow band amplifier okay if you add a resistance you it would add noise okay if you had a, a resonant circuit you would get a high impedance at resonance 
without adding a physical resistor and you'd get a narrow band noise which would reject out of band noise too okay okay what else you also have a couple of other capacitors here cl which is the input capacitance of the next stage plus the drain to bulb capacitance of this transistor itself okay and okay so i'll i'll draw it in a different color i'm going to call it rd it's not a physical resistor but at resonance that is the impedance of the resonant network lc tank looking upwards okay and this will be a function of of the qs of ld ld and cd sure but gds we are right now neglecting because what will happen is these rds which will get here will be maybe a couple of 100 ohms or something like that whereas gds may be much higher okay and for this network f not you can calculate f not and you can sorry okay normally what you want is for good operating uh, conditions to make sure your circuit is you know your resonant frequency is not very sensitive to parasitics you need to make sure definitely much greater than cdb okay you don't want it to be sensitive to your transistor size the parasitics may vary okay with your transistor size with uh, with your bias conditions and so on you don't want to do that okay you also don't want to be too dependent on the load capacitance this may not be always possible but you don't want to be too dependent on that okay the reason is quite often you want the mixer design to be independent of your uh, lna design okay you don't want to be uh, dependent because if you're let's say you want more gain from the mixer you might need to change the mixer size you don't want to come back and redo the lna okay okay next we'll look at stability sorry the main reason is you want to make your design of a lna in, you try to make it independent of the design of the mixer okay so obviously if the mixer size changes so okay so the lna is driving the mixer in a typical uh, receiver okay and uh, if the let's say you 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 are redesigning the mixer for some reason you don't want your lna you know output resonant frequency and other things to get affected okay now this may not always be possible okay it depends on what frequency you are operating at what the inductor value is ld now obviously the next question is how you how you would choose ld right you try to choose ld and uh, um, uh, cd such that you get the maximum R rd why why do you want to get the maximum rd because the overall gain is gm effective times rd so you want to get more gain okay if you have broadband is it i mean i need to say that uh, we feel like independent of uh, the lde sensitive uh, cdb so okay so what we are trying to do is we are trying to make cd great much greater than cl plus cdb okay if you do that then you can approximate your resonant frequency to LD, uh, you know 1 over 2 pi root ld cd okay and that's the idea you want to make sure f not does not move with parasitics okay you want to make sure it does not move when your mixer design changes when you have a broadband requirement when you have a broadband like large frequency range for example okay sharp yes and we are in this case we are designing a narrow band uh, uh, lna okay if you are designing a very broadband lna um, well when you say broadband do you mean like a low pass lna yes. right when you do a low pass lna we'll come to it later in the course okay we'll see there are techniques for improving the bandwidth of low pass lnas okay to make it uh, insensitive to your uh, well you try to make it insensitive to load capacitance okay there are techniques to do that i think we will have time to come to that at the end of uh, the course okay in that case we will not use ldcd that network is 
yes it will okay it will have ld it may not have cd okay it will definitely have ld okay but that's the simplest case would be just ld with a series resistance okay um, there are more complex cases we will we'll come to it later in the course okay let's get back to our stability okay so this is characterized by what is called the the stern stability factor okay which is represented by k oh sorry okay 1 plus mod delta squared minus s1 mod s11 squared minus mod s22 squared over 2 mod s12 mod s21 so it completely depends on your s parameters of your two port so this is a very general situation okay for any two port with s parameters okay okay and your delta is s11 s22 minus s12 s21 <coughs> okay so one of the things you want to apart from not having any negative resistances right so the other thing you can do is try to reduce s12 okay <coughs> because what happens is so that effectively what you are saying is you are reducing your remember s12 to stand for your reverse isolation okay so if you reduce s12 your uh, uh, stability will automatically become better okay actually like before we go there so i think i the conditions for stability right man it looks really bad okay okay if you have k greater than 1 and delta less than 1 if both of these are satisfied it's unconditionally stable yes yes in in terms of the s parameters that's right because what you will see is pretty much any L because if you if you are designing an lna you will pretty much be dealing with only the s parameters okay so what you will do is you want an input match you want your s11 to be very small okay if you want output match you want s s uh, uh, s22 to be very good very low okay remember s12 is a uh, sign of reverse isolation you want to reduce that s21 is a sign of your power gain okay so you are pretty much dealing with s parameters and not with i mean if you are analyzing it as a block okay and that is what you want to do because as a uh, the lna system as a whole you want to make sure it it's unconditionally stable that's why you are dealing with this now when you get to more detailed um, i guess more uh, uh, i guess more finer details what you'll do is when you start looking at the gain and so on then you start looking at you know the gm of the transistor the uh, parallel resistance of the resonant tank and so on but as far as the overall system is concerned this is the best way to look at the stability okay uh, one of the other sorry go ahead okay if okay i'll tell you so if you if you go back to your original let's say this is the equivalent circuit of your transistor right of your amplifier is there any chance that this could be unstable actually in this case there is no chance first of all it's a single stage okay and you have resonance circuits all over okay you don't have any cgd first of all so your s12 is characterized by your cgd okay if your cgd is much very large your s12 will be pretty bad your reverse isolation will be very bad okay so in this case for example if you if you just consider the amplifier by itself it's a single stage amplifier there's no chance for it to be stable however you can have for example cgd you can have based on your layout you can have parasitic capacitances input output capacitances 
okay you can have problems with you know which uh, things parasitic routing capacitances routing resistances can change your s11 s22 and so on so at the end of the day you can't just look at the circuit alone you have to look at the overall lna system from the input to the output and that's the main reason why because you are dealing with a case where parasitics can be pretty important in deciding your stability okay and exactly but then once once you have the parasitics into account right you can't go back and look at the circuit and say you know whether it's stable the circuit itself may be perfectly stable and in but overall system you'll have you, yeah you will be dealing with the s parameters okay and then you'll be dealing with the stern stability factor for your uh, stability okay okay and what did what does it say cgd is related to your s12 okay so what we'll do is we'll stop here i have a little bit more but i think you guys can take a look at it it's just the uh, you know how the input impedance varies as a function of cgd okay i'll post up the notes you can take a look at it it's very straightforward okay the main thing to note is that if you look at the input impedance of a transistor with a cgd what you'll find is it has a negative component okay negative resistance component which is proportional to cgd so the larger cgd gets the worse the negative component and the more unstable it the system can get okay